Welcome everyone, I'm Aggie Alves from Discovery Education and we're here live at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. We're here at NIST for Pi Day, which is tomorrow, March 14th, and for the next 30 minutes you're going to see how Pi and math are used in real world problems worth solving. You can join the discussion on Twitter by tagging us at DiscoveryEd using the hashtag Pi Day 2015. Joining us today is Jennifer Wergo from the Public Affairs Office. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Aggie. Tell us what goes on at NIST. Lots of things happen here at NIST. Uh, we have scientists doing research in chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, engineering, and Pi figures into a lot of the work we do because circles are found everywhere in nature and also in a lot of technology. Uh, our scientists are experts in measurement, and measurement is really important to our lives because you want to make sure that you get the right dose of medicine or that firefighters know the best way to fight a fire. Measurement helps us with standards. That's another big thing we do here at NIST. We help develop standards that keep us safe. For example, your yellow school bus has a standard color. All school buses in the country use that color, and that's because it's a color that's easy to see out of the corner of your eye, and when drivers see it, they know to keep an eye out for children. Well, it really does impact every aspect of our life. Absolutely. We were at the National Archives in September for a virtual field trip, and I learned from you an interesting fact that NIST has played a major role in preserving some very important documents there. Isn't that right? That's right. We worked on the Charters of Freedom, and in 1951, we were asked to build the first cases to protect them. You want to make sure that they don't get wet, um, that oxygen doesn't get to them, and even microbes can eat them, so we need to protect the documents from that. We built the new set in 2003. So the Charters of Freedom are the... Uh, the Constitution. Uh, so there are about four pages of the Constitution, mm -hmm. I believe, are in there. And the Declaration of Independence and, and the, the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights. <laughs> you got it. Right. Well, we learned some other interesting facts. You took us on a tour last week. And so let's watch. We're on the Gaithersburg, Maryland campus of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We have about 500 acres of property and more than 3,000 people working here, including scientists, engineers, different types of researchers, including mathematicians. Here on this campus, also in Boulder, Colorado, we have about 300 people working. Here in our lobby, we have several interactive exhibits where people can learn about some of the projects here at NIST, but also a lot of our important history. In the NIST library, we also have a museum that has artifacts dating back to NIST's founding in 1901. Here in the nano our researchers study and build things on the tiniest of scales, billionths of a meter. Behind me is a clean room where the air is so clean there are only 3.5 particles per cubic liter of air. Out here, there are tens of millions of particles. Researchers in the clean room need to keep themselves covered from head to toe because even a stray eyelash or flake of skin could ruin one of their experiments. You'll notice there's a lot of natural light in this building that helps save on the cost of electricity, but it also makes for a really nice environment for the researchers who have to work in that clean room. They can still see outside. Okay, so now we're going to take an elevator down three stories to where we have two underground buildings full of specialized laboratories. We're now standing outside a laboratory that is 12 meters underground to help isolate it from vibrations, say, of a truck driving by. Because when you're measuring things at really tiny scales, even the slightest vibration can wreck your experiment. 
You'll also notice some special lights in that room that are reflective light tubes. Instead of putting a light bulb in the room, you keep the light outside because even the temperature of a light bulb can mess with the room temperature inside and ruin an experiment. So we're ending our tour here in the NIST lobby underneath one of NIST's many clocks that are synchronized to the official U.S. time, which NIST helps to define. So every time you look at your watch, you can think of NIST. I said it was a brief tour because obviously this is a huge campus and uh, we could only fit so much in. But we do have some questions from students. Um, this one, the first one, is actually about the clock. Colin of Loft Academy in Kentucky asks, is the NIST F1 a clock in its own right? or does it only coordinate between multiple clocks? If it coordinates between clocks, how does it decide which is the most correct? The F1 clock and its partner, F2, are very special clocks. They're actually called time standards or frequency standards, so they're not the kinds of clocks you'd find on a classroom wall keeping track of the time of day. They help us measure the second, and we use the time they tell us, or the length of the second they tell us, to calibrate or to make sure our other clocks are working. We have time scales, a series of clocks that help us determine what time of day it is. We can figure out using the standard if they're running fast, if they're running slow, and make corrections. Now these are the clocks that are in Boulder, is this the Boulder, atomic Colorado. clock? Correct. Okay, so there's more than one clock? We have two now. The um, F2 went into service in um, the spring of last year. Okay, good. Well, we have another question, and this one is from Jenna. She's in Rockville High School right here in Maryland, and Jenna wants to know what kind of research is going on in the underground labs? We have a lot of neat things going on in those labs. They're very specialized. We have one laboratory where we can move atoms, manipulate them, single atoms, and put them in any position we want. We also have um, a measurement experiment done there, or a measurement done, that uh, tells us the, it helps us measure electricity. And all measurements of electricity in the country are based on what's done in that laboratory. That's also where we keep the kilogram. And we're going to talk about the kilogram mm -hmm. in a little bit. But I do have to tell you, that elevator was the biggest elevator I have ever <laughs> seen. What is it used for? Uh, that elevator needed to be big so that we could bring in instruments. We have very large tables where we work. They have to be big tables so that they're stable for the experiments. Well, fire is something that NIST has been researching for a very long time, and it's, and it's actually a big part of the history of NIST. Can you tell us about that? That's right. NIST got into fire research in the early 1900s. In 1904, there was a massive fire in the city of Baltimore. Firefighters had to come from New York, from Philadelphia, from Washington, D.C. to try and put it out. Unfortunately, when the out-of-town firefighters got here, they couldn't hook up their fire hoses to the local hydrants. Why, why not? Every town had its own system. They okay. weren't standardized. They mm -hmm. weren't agreeing on the same system. Uh, so the firefighters um, had to battle that fire for two days, and 1,500 buildings were burnt. Amazingly, no one died. After the fires, where NIST really came in to help, we brought firefighters together from across the country to try and come up with a standard way of building the equipment so that a firefighter from one town could help out in a different town. And, and that seems to be what NIST does. NIST brings industry together and, and brings companies together um, so that they can come to some agreement on the fact that standards are needed, it sounds like. Absolutely. So standards are agreed upon ways of doing things. And in this country, we have a lot of industry standards. NIST plays a huge role in that, bringing together experts from uh, universities, from industry, from government agencies, all coming together to figure out the best way to do things, the best way to solve national challenges. Well, the research that's being done on fires today is so fascinating. And we visited with Dr. Craig Weinschenk in the Fire Research Division. Take a look. Here at NIST in the Fire Research Division, we use math and science and engineering to solve real-world problems with practical implications. Uh, these involve you know, developing test standards for equipment, developing ways to improve firefighter tactics, to understand how wildland fires in impact the built environment. And we do this with experiments and mathematical computer models. The goal of the research here is to save lives. We aim to reduce and limit uh, firefighter injuries, civilian injuries, and reduce and limit property damage from fires. So house fires today are much different than house fires 20 to 30 years ago, and that's because the fuels have changed. The fuels being most commonly furniture in house fires. They're made of synthetic fuels such as polyurethane, um, which is much different than old fuels which were cotton and wood based. And what I'm going to do here is show you a slight demo in terms of uh, if we burn in a modern fuel, a modern fuel and an old fuel, and, and show you the different characteristics of what might might occur 
when these things are burning and assess the hazard that occurs. So first what I'm going to do is, is burn a piece of cardboard which is representative of an older style of fuel which is much more natural burning such as uh, woods or cottons. And as we see the fire here, what we don't see is a lot of soot. We don't see a lot of black smoke coming off of this fuel. It's a lot cleaner burning. Um, you get a lot more complete combustion, meaning most of the products here are carbon monoxide and uh, water vapor. In fact, it's actually a little harder to burn uh, as we see it actually uh, extinguish itself here. Um, so here I'm going to burn a piece of polystyrene. Uh, this is a, a fuel that's more common in houses today than we saw 20 to 30 years ago. And as I ignite it, you'll see that we get a lot more black smoke compared to our natural fuel. Uh, if you can see the, the soot coming off of that, the, black, the thick black smoke, uh, that's typically common in fuels today in your house. Your polyurethane in your couches, um, some of the synthetic materials in your floor, and you actually see that it drips and melts. Um, this poses a much greater hazard to um, occupants in the house as well as firefighters arriving on scene to uh, put the fire out when they get there. Um, and one of the things we see is that this smoke, all of this black smoke is a fuel. This could actually be reignited and increase the hazard for anyone on scene as, as we change the fire environment. Also note is how quickly um, this piece of polystyrene uh, burned all the way through compared to the natural fiber that was the cardboard. So one of the main things we do here is study modern fire dynamics and the modern fire environment. And how one of the things I'm going to do here with a demo is show that smoke is a fuel. And the reason this is important is because in modern construction, houses are more well sealed than they used to be. And so when a fire starts in a modern structure, we have uh, all three components of the fire triangle. We have fuel, we have oxygen, we have heat. As that fire continues to grow, we have less oxygen coming into the structure, so the fuel starts to be, uh, consume all of the oxygen and the fire will become very fuel rich. So we have a lot of smoke and a lot of heat in the structure. And then when ventilation changes, whether the fire breaks a window or firefighters ventilate the structure, you've now introduced oxygen, so you've completed the fire triangle again, and you have reignition in a very dangerous condition. And to show that smoke is a fuel, what I'm going to do here is use a candle. And we can blow out the candle and see that the smoke produced from the candle, I can reignite by touching a heat source to the candle, and you'll see that the fire um, drops right back down to the wick of the candle and is sustained burning. And so without touching the flame to the candle wick, I'm able to reignite the candle because smoke is a fuel. Pi is, is very important to the research we're doing here at the Fire Research Division. Uh, one of the things that we focus on is, is fire, obviously, and the amount of energy that, that gets radiated from a fire is determined by the distance you are away from the fire. And so that's essentially determined by the size of the fire divided by 4 pi r squared, or the volume of the sphere that is encompassing of the, the point source radiation. And the importance for, for us specifically is testing firefighter equipment and developing the test standards um, that are used to assess the quality of, of the equipment used on the fire ground. And one of the things we did was we exposed face pieces to, to um, a, a particular fire size or the equivalent of a fire size in a lab environment. And as we moved the firefighter equipment closer and closer to the fire, we noticed that the damage increased. And here we have the closest failure, and this is a failure of a firefighter face piece exposed to um, the equivalent of a 20 kilowatts per meter squared heat flux. And so if we can educate the fire service and educate uh, homeowners about the uh, conditions that they might see on a typical fire ground, then we can make the fire ground safer for everyone. It's just fascinating, and, and they love the work that they're doing on fire because they know that they can actually save lives. So how are they getting the word out to cities and counties and you know, across the country about these safety standards that they're working on? Our fire f researchers do a lot of outreach to community fire departments, and they work with um, different firefighting associations. Uh, they also have a Twitter accounts, so you can follow NIST Fire to keep up to date on the latest research. But again, the, the, the cities can choose, the firefighting companies can choose or, or not choose whether to you know, implement any of this, the, the research, the findings that they have. Is that, is that correct? Right. Firefighters, uh, different organizations um, make their own decisions on what kind of standards they're going to develop. It's usually by industry, say firefighting or the construction industry. Mm -hmm. um, and in certain places, there are rules that the government does um, mandate or say that you have to follow certain standards. Well, I know he told us that um, LA um, implemented some of this, the safety standards, the firefighting techniques that they had researched, and have actually 
uh, reduced the number of deaths by 50% of firefighters. So good stuff going on there. We have another question. This question is from Tommy at Golden Oak Montessori Charter in California. Tommy wants to know what has NIST accomplished that's had the biggest impact on people? <laughs> that's a really difficult question because NIST has been around for a hundred years and we affect every day of your lives. So I think uh, what the biggest impact is depends on who you ask. Firefighters, we've helped make them safer with better equipment. Uh, police officers, they have better body armor, mm -hmm. better tools to investigate DNA or fingerprints at a crime scene. Uh, doctors and dentists have better tools to help keep you healthy. Like the drill. That's right. There's the dental <laughs> I know the drill. Kids like that. <laughs> but also the x-ray. Um, we helped with that. So there's a lot of work that, um, that NIST does that makes every day of your life better. One of the things I find really fascinating that we do is um, disaster investigations. So after an earthquake, after a major fire, after a tornado, our researchers will go in and try and understand what went wrong with a building or with some kind of system so that we can make better standards, um, better measurement to, and better measurements to um, improve things for the future. Well, we saw a piece in the tour, we saw a piece of the bridge. Um, the, what, what bridge was that? The silver bridge? Silver bridge. Yes, yes. That's so this right. had a big role in researching what went wrong there. Right, that was one of our earliest disaster um, studies. We also looked at, have looked at major fires. Um, the World Trade Center was our biggest disaster investigation with 200, about 200 researchers oh, really? studying it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, math, I know, was a part and is a part of all of that. And so we're going, finally, to meet the math division. And who heads it up is Dr. Ron Boisvert. He and his team work with Pi every day. Check it out. I have a team of about 50 uh, mathematicians in my division. We're applied mathematicians. What we do is take mathematics and apply it to solve the measurement problems that come up at NIST. And there are lots of problems. And being a mathematician at NIST is, is a fun thing. Mathematics is a universal tool. It applies to all areas of science. So learning, uh, 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 once you have a grab bag of mathematical tools, you can apply it in many different areas. Our mathematicians one day can be working with a physicist trying to understand how uh, subatomic particles interact. And the next day, if you're working with an engineer trying to understand the energy efficiency of a building by understanding how air flows through a skyscraper. So we do work at all scales and the mathematical tools are very similar and we apply them to all these different kinds of areas. So how do we use Pi here at NIST? Well, it's really in almost everything we do. Um, whenever we study periodic phenomena, Pi naturally, naturally appears in the equations. What, what is periodic phenomena? It's something that happens, it, that repeats over and over again. The relationship with pi comes from the fact that when you're sitting on a circle and walk around the circumference, you come back to the same place. So circles and pi sort of naturally appear in things that repeat. What, what repeats? Uh, a pendulum repeats, the swinging back and forth of a pendulum. Uh, if, you're in a, if you're riding in a boat and look behind you, the waves, the wake that's behind the boat, that's a periodic phenomena. And there's lots of wave-like uh, uh, phenomena in, in physics and, uh, and in the things we study in NIST. Light is one of them. All kinds of electromagnetic radiation, x-rays, but just visible light uh, is a wave-like phenomenon. So um, what you see behind me here, light is actually used as a tool to slow down atoms. So here we create something called a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is the coldest matter in the entire universe. Um, it's colder than, than space, it's colder than anything in the universe. And we use this uh, to, it, to be able to measure things better. When you, when you slow down atoms, you can actually measure their properties uh, much better. Uh, there, so it's used uh, for clocks, building better clocks. Ultimately, we may actually be able to build even computers out of very cold atoms that we can control using, using beams of light. Well, I can check that off my bucket list. I've now been in the room with the coldest matter in the universe. <laughs> you must love working here. It's an amazing place to work. Well, we have another question from a student. This is from Madeline. She is at Peachtree Charter Middle School in Georgia. Madeline asks, is the U.S. the only country not on the metric system? Why do we have liters of soda but quarts of milk? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we are not. Uh, actually, all countries in the world use the metric system, including the United States. Also, it's also called the International System of Units, or SI units. So that's meters and kilograms and seconds. And the United States uh, does not have a mandatory system, so you don't have to use it. 
companies can use both the, uh, the traditional system and the metric system. Milk was traditionally sold in gallons, so we still use that system there. But actually when NIST was founded in 1901, there were about eight official gallons. So you could go to one town, pay 20 cents for a gallon of milk, go to the next town, hand them 20 cents, and they'd give you a smaller container. So that wasn't <gasps> fair at all. That's, I should say not. <laughs> and so NIST does the same thing with, like when you go to the gas pump. You know, making sure that a gallon of gas is the same across the country? That's right. We help build the measurement tools so that states can help. Um, uh, they have uh, folks who go out and check the stations. You'll see a sticker. That's from your state weights and measures division. And NIST helps that build the tools and trains them so they can make those measurements. Well, I think you're finding more and more that when you look on products that you will see both a metric unit and then you know something that says quarts or gallons or whatever so are, are we seems like we're headed in that direction that's right it's a long process um, it can be a long process to go fully over to the metric system and as our uh, one of our directors put it uh, the US is kind of bilingual when it comes to measurement we use our traditional system of measurement but we also use the metric system that's a good way of putting it well we visited with a team that's working on the kilogram which is a metric unit of measurement um, they're working on a very special project involving the kilogram. Here's Dr. Patrick Abbott. So here we are in the viewing room, which is right outside of the kilogram room, where we keep our national prototypes. And I've put one, uh, K79, right behind me so that you can get a feeling for what it looks like. So we have to make sure that our mass measurements are accurate, because if they're not, we're in big trouble, not only in the United States, but with respect to the rest of the world because then our kilogram isn't the same as somebody else's kilogram, say in China or some other country, and that just can't be. So K79 is actually a cylinder, and since we know those diameters and the height, we can calculate the volume by using pi r squared times the height. That volume is very important because the kilogram that we're working with displaces air, which is actually sort of like holding a beach ball under a pool of water, there's a force that wants to push it back up, right? Well, it's the same with the kilogram, only it's air that's pushing on the kilogram up and we have to account for that or else we don't get the correct mass. So by knowing the volume of the kilogram and by knowing the density of the air, we can multiply it together and get that special, what we call buoyancy correction. So pi is, a, is an important constant for us because we have to make sure that our prototypes, like K79, are the same as the international prototype, which lives in Paris. So in order to compare the two and to calibrate K79 against the international prototype, we have to physically take it over. I have to carry it in a briefcase because it's very valuable. It's, it's over $100,000 to make a new one. And it's also very fragile if it gets dropped or bumped or any way damaged, then all of the history that we have and the stability, that is how well it, it, it stays the same, will be affected. So we have to treat it very, very carefully. It's a very expensive, time consuming, and very inconvenient process to have to all the time take our kilogram all the way over to Paris in a special briefcase and go through customs and get special letters so that nobody will open my briefcase and, and touch the kilogram and possibly contaminate or damage it. Plus, uh, we would like to be able to do this at home uh, so, that, so that we don't have to spend all this time and money and effort. So now there's an effort on to, to redefine how we do things in mass, how we measure a kilogram so that we will actually be able to realize a kilogram right here at NIST. And instead of having to travel all the way over to Paris, I just have to travel down the hall to the watt balance. So this is the watt balance, at least the Lego version of it. We don't want to continuously have to depend on an artifact mass, a physical object, to define mass. We want to sever that tie and we want to relate it to, for example, electricity. So in a nutshell, what we're doing here is we're putting a mass on one side and counterbalancing it with an electromagnetic force on the other side whose strength is determined by the amount of electricity that actually flows through the coil. And if you fast forward through all the, all the specific steps, ultimately the goal is to replace the uh, object, the master kilogram, with uh, a known constant related to electricity. 
So who knew you'd find Legos at NIST? <laughs> well, so any idea how long it will be before the physical kilogram is replaced and Dr. Abbott doesn't have to travel to Paris with a <laughs> kilogram in tow in his suitcase? Uh, well, the international effort is aiming at 19, uh, excuse me, 2018 to make the change. Well, I'm sure that'll be a relief to him. It must be a real hardship going to Paris no <laughs> doubt. to measure against the, the Paris kilogram. Well, the last place that we visited was the 3D cave, where Dr. Judy Terrell and her team spent a lot of time in virtual reality. Take a look at what they do. My team works on high-impact problems that requires large supercomputers to solve. We also work on uh, immersive visualization, which is 3D. When we talk about 3D in our work, it's different than when you go to the movies. In the movies, it's a passive experience. But if you are at the movie and you can get up with your glasses on and walk over to the screen and walk into it, if there's like a dinosaur here and you could walk all the way around and see every part of it, look at his teeth, look at how tall he is, look at his toenails, and then have things happen based on what you wanted to happen, then you would be doing what we're doing. So we start off by getting data from the scientist and then we do an initial visualization. Then the rest is an interactive process with the scientist because the scientists may see something they weren't expecting or they may see what they're expecting but they may want uh, a better understanding of what's going on through analysis tools. So we have projects, for example, tissue engineering, and um, to grow tissues that they might want to uh, insert into your body, for example, on your skin or in bone, they need something to grow the cells on. They have to have something to stick to. And so they make a structure that the cells can attach to and proceed to grow and fill it up. And that's called the scaffolding, but not all scaffoldings support cell growth as well as others. And so we brought one up in our virtual environment and uh, created measurements of the scaffold and could report on how well a particular scaffold measured uh, up to the design specification. The end result of studying scaffolding is to have repeatable manufacturing techniques so that they would be used in places where people need replacements of various kinds due to uh, maybe birth defects or accidents or other injuries, something that would enable people to function fully again. So another project is studying uh, rheometers, which is a device to measure flow. Um, specifically various stages of concrete. And if you have real concrete and you're measuring it, you can't see inside. We have the advantage that we can see inside. When you put a material into this rheometer, um, it has a certain viscosity. For example, water is something that flows very easily. Honey does not flow so easily. And it's something that's very important because one of the things that we've noticed um, through our 3D visualization, because we can interact with it, the large rocks carry most of the system stress. So they're going to be the ones that are largely responsible for the jamming. And once you're inside there, you can see what's going on and you can see how they line up to jam. You can see how they form chains and jamming means that it's not going to flow and you're gonna have a big hole. <laughs> you certainly don't want to be that one of the pillars of your bridge. So it's important to really understand the flow properties of concrete. So we use Pi in both visualization and analysis. For example, um, this blade is something that goes inside a rheometer, it turns, and then the system measures the um, properties of the fluid that is in the device. As you notice, this is basically a stretched out circle. Once you have a circle, you have pi. And, uh, and so it's necessary to have pi in order to be able to model this. Once you model this, then you have a model that you can put into a 3D printer, and this is in fact 3D printed from that model. Well, you can use the same model in the supercomputer code to be able to run the same experiment that you're running in the laboratory. And then you could use the same model in the visualization in order to be able to see the result and analyze it. 
When you're looking at a computer screen, things get hidden, or, um, or your mind can be um, given false cues. When you're in with the rocks, there are no false cues. And, and you have the advantage of making it larger than you, so you can look at individual spots in it. Um, you could stop the simulation um, and uh, look at how things are lining up with each other. Sometimes these rocks can form chains, and um, that can be very difficult to pick out if you're just looking at something on a screen. Um, whereas if you're in 3D, you have a lot more capability. And, um, uh, and the fact that you can change it relative to your body size, because you're part of the visualization, really. You can make it very tiny, uh, or you can make it much bigger than you, depending on what type of information you're trying to get out. So we're getting a lot of information that can't be gotten any other way. And when we get it visually, our mind notices patterns. And that really helps with understanding what's going on. Well, I got to try the 3D glasses and swim in the flowing concrete so much better than going to the movies. Well, we have a few seconds left. Tell us what are some of the other major projects that NIST is working on. Uh, one thing I didn't get a chance to mention was cybersecurity. NIST is doing a lot to make online shopping, uh, checking medical records, that kind of stuff safer online for everybody. Well, that's so important now, especially in, in the environment when you're hearing about companies being hacked and credit cards being stolen and identity theft and everything. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank all of the scientists, mathematicians, and engineers who opened their labs up to us. If you want to keep track of their projects, check out the NIST website, www.nist.gov. You can watch the archive of today's program by going to discoveryeducation.com forward slash Pi Day. And if you want to see more real world problems worth solving, check out our math tech book, discoveryeducation.com forward slash math tech book. I want to thank you so much for opening up NIST to us. We had a great time. Tomorrow is Pie Day. I hope you all have a blast <laughs> celebrating it tomorrow and don't eat too much pie. On behalf of everyone here at Discovery Education, thank you. Happy Pie Day and thank you for joining us.